welcome to the Your Parenting Mojo podcast. Today, we're going to take a dive into a topic that cuts across many of the ideas that we discuss here on the podcast. We're going to take a critical look at the topic of developmental psychology as a whole and what we can learn about it when we raise our eyes up off the specific topics like theory of mind and language development and attachment that we often spend a lot of time delving into and consider the topics that these sit within. My guest for the conversation is Professor Erica Berman. Professor Berman is Professor of Education at the University of Manchester, Associate Fellow of the British Psychological Society and the United Kingdom Council of Psychotherapists Registered Group Analyst. She trained as a developmental psychologist and is well known as a critical developmental psychologist specializing in innovative and activist qualitative research. Her research is focused on critical developmental and educational psychology, feminist and post-colonial theory, childhood studies, on critical mental health practice, particularly around gender and cultural issues. Much of her work addresses the connections between emotions, mental health, and individual and social change. She's a past chair of the Psychology of Women section of the British Psychological Society, and in 2016, she was awarded an honorary lifetime fellowship of the British Psychological Society in recognition of her contribution to psychology. She is associate editor of the Sage Encyclopedia of Childhood and Childhood Studies and the author of a number of books, most significantly, Deconstructing De Developmental Psychology. And since it seems as though friends of the book have the right to call it DDP, we're going to go ahead and do that here too. DDP is now in its third edition and was honored with a special edition of the journal Feminism and Psychology, discussing the impact of the book on the 20th anniversary of the publication of the first edition of the book, which really critiques mainstream theories and research methods to help Help us understand whether research on child development tells us more about the child, the researchers, or the social environment that both of these exist within. So whether you're expecting a child, or you're a new parent, perhaps you're newer to my work, or whether you already have a child who's getting on in years and you've been a listener for a while, you're going to find something new in this conversation that helps you step outside these usual topics and ask, well, how did we get here? And where are we going? And even is this where we want to go? Welcome, Professor Berman. It's such an honor to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So maybe we can start with the, a, a little topic at the beginning of, of all of this, the, the study of child development. How did we start studying children? How did all this come about? Well, yes, it's uh, not a small question. And um, I guess there are different ways of uh, telling that story of how child development came about. And the kind of the conventional story that you will read about in um, child development textbooks usually talks about um, the emergence of the child study movement um, that uh, principally, in fact, moneyed men of a certain kind of class background um, started to take an interest in their, in their own children um, and, uh, and started um, studying them in some detail. So the first studies about children and childhood that, that are of a sort of semi-formal kind are observational studies by the men, not uh, by the fathers, not the mothers, mm -hmm. who were deemed to be uh, too partial and uh, anyway, otherwise occupied and not intellectual enough to engage in this uh, esteemed uh, new area of study. Um, and they, 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 so they're diary studies. And indeed that, that methodological approach remains a very important one for the study of early childhood in general, especially um, sort of very early childhood and, and language development and so on. Um, so the child study movement um, in a sense uh, um, launches or, or occurs at the, at the same time as both the, the, the beginning of, of the study of psychology, but also um, psychiatry. And in a way, psych, child psychology and psychiatry really were elaborated alongside each other, almost indistinguishable. Um, and, you know, the, the questions that were motivating those first studies um, and, and inquiries uh, it's fair to say, I think, we're not really specifically about children. It was, you, it was an interest in the study of the child as a way to explore much more general philosophical questions. Um, questions about nature and nurture, uh, questions um, that, that themselves are sort of um, laid on to older questions about 
original sin or free will, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and and uh, so, and we continue to live with those big, big philosophical questions that people tend to look to the study of childhood to solve. And I have to admit that in a way, that's what kind of brought me to uh, study developmental psychology. It wasn't that I was interested in, in children particularly. I was, I just sort of felt like a true modern rationalist uh, that this was a way to sort of uh, engage in, a lot, you know, very general interests I had. Um, as, as also uh, was the case for Piaget, who, who, um, uh, who was motivated to study, and, but it wasn't just him, but uh, the, the origins of knowledge and how it developed through the study of the child. Mm -hmm. so, so there were these kind of philosophical questions and they were, and people were sort of starting to explore them alongside a set of political concerns um, that were uh, of the time and of the political structures of the time with the rise of the nation state and so on um, uh, about um, the state of the population, um, about molding um, and in a sense uh, sort of knowing about and also controlling the future uh, workforce, um, uh, future citizens, etc. Now all of that is I think um, sort of one version of um, the story of the origins of child development that, that is generally quite widely accepted. I think there's another uh, another narrative that one I would want to add in there, second one, which I've already alluded to about the, ri the rise of the nation state, um, that all of this was happening um, alongside, uh, you know, imperial imperialist wars going on. I mean, the, these these gentlemen who were studying children were also the gentlemen who were going off and studying the flora and fauna of exotic, what were to them exotic places and bringing them back. You know, if you come and look around the English countryside, it's full of full of plants that were brought uh, from all over the world that, that these gentlemen tried to recreate in their, you know, in their land <laughs> that they owned. Um, so that, you know, Britain's full of rhododendra, but that's the national plant of the Himalayas. <laughs> no, mm. Nepal, I think it is. <laughs> um, so, so what was happening was uh, uh, these, you know, that, that in a way, um, children, the study of children quite late, uh, emerged quite late in the scene, it, you know, because really the, yeah, the flora and fauna were <laughs> of more interest for quite a long time. And it was only when these other kind of political agendas started to surface about uh, um, managing populations, including colonized populations, that children became a good route by which to think about that and the management of, of, of parenting. Um, but all of this, of course, was happening. It's not just about psychology or child psychology. It was happening alongside uh, the rise of other social science, sciences, you could say, like so sociology and social policy. And I think it's also worth bearing in mind that, you know, I, I said that, you know, these child studies, in a sense, seem to kick it off. So that's the sort of second narrative, uh, I think, uh, that's important. And there's, there's a third one um, that I think is important uh, in thinking about how and how and when, why childhood came to be seen as a distinct category. And I mean, that's where we need to sort of think more broadly, historically and culturally, and think about how the, the invention of childhood, because we, I mean, you know, we know that, that, that there is a history of childhood of, um, and what that means from Philippe Arriers uh, onwards, that the, the invention of the idea of childhood as a distinct social category rather than something that was integrated in daily life, that that coincided um, with, with emerging ideas within European culture, uh, within and from European culture, about the, the idea of the individual and that that individual has a sort of interiority, a self. Mm -hmm. um, now, that is really something that, in, in terms of uh, our ideas about ourselves, 
and our, con our awareness of ourselves really kind of starts from the mid 18th century onwards. Um, and so these ideas about childhood uh, were emerging alongside the idea of the individual and alongside the idea that that individual has an interiority, has some, you know, some sense of awareness of itself, um, can reflect on separately uh, from others. And, and that was emerging alongside other disciplines like, I, well, the uh, great growth in the ideas of um, uh, associated with, with what we would now recognize to be biology. And equally at the same time, um, psychoanalysis, the ideas that then eventually were to be sort of named by Freud as psychoanalysis. So ideas about nature, that is, and ideas about history. And this is where, I mean, I'm very convinced by the account that Carolyn Steedman um, wrote a long time ago about, um, uh, it's called Strange Dislocations, Childhood and the Idea of Human Interiority. And um, I think it's sort of 18 something to 19 something because historians always do that. Um, so you have to situate the, the rise of child, the interest in childhood alongside these other sort of developments in, mm. in people's ideas about, about uh, the course of development or the course of history, having it having a course, having a going somewhere and having consequences. And I think um, all that invites, you know, several other kinds of questions, uh, which include, well, I suppose the first one is, you know, can we only study, when we study children, are we only studying children? I mean, it's one of the claims I make in deconstructing developmental psychology that the idea of the child, you know, that the child always involves constituting positions for others around that child, whether it's the proximal positions of the caregivers and the, you know, the gender positions of all of that or family um, or professionals or uh, or the state uh, or whatever. So 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 really, when we're, we can't abstract the child from other sets of relationships, I mean, you can see I'm a psychotherapist as well here, <laughs> our fantasies of our lost selves or our better selves, um, something of, or our true selves, something like that, that gets always played out in people's hopes and fears and fantasies about childhood. And that's all been going for quite a long time since, you know, I think the, from the mid 18th century onwards, because if you look at that history of you know of the that um, Sally Shuttleworth writes about in and other other historians of childhood um, of European childhood, there were always sort of crises about child labour, about um, hot house children, and them being you know sort of. Uh, cramming and and being forced to learn things they didn't want to uh there's always been pan moral panics you might say about children's sexuality that's always been a difficult area etc etc um so the in a sense that historic that wider historical view is useful to see that generally speaking the the sort of hot issues that we we encounter in our day are not all are not new, but are just a new take on a very long-standing set of themes. Yeah. But also, I think that there are consequences for thinking about that the, the ways our fantasies about ourselves get tied up with what we think about uh, and, and want for children that typically get in the way, in my opinion, of our engagement with the, the you know, the, the actual embodied in specific children yeah. in front of yeah. us and I think I say this quite a lot in the book <laughs> but and an overall you know the third issue uh, uh, that arises is is that I think there's genuine confusion given that there's so much going on in the study of the child there's genuine confusion about what the unit of development is uh, and uh, as well as you know the temp what model of time if you like I mean are we talking about individual development? Are we talking about child development? Are we talking about national development? Um, because, um, because all of these get concerns get, or international development, they all get wrapped up 
into the study of the child in a way that I think becomes remarkably inattentive to particular children. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I've been doing a lot of uh, research on resilience over the last few days, and, and I think it really comes out there that many of the, the criteria that we use to judge children's resilience are related to things like um, their executive function capabilities, their grades, their employment, their uh, cr criminality or lack thereof. And it's pretty clear that the state has very vested interest in a particular outcome here and and to the extent that they can support development in the younger years and have it be cost effective later on then yeah we're, we're, we're talking about the development of the state as we're talking about how to support individual children and of course on the international stage it plays out in similar statistics and league tables of standardized test results I guess would be the most obvious one that comes to mind yeah absolutely yeah yeah. Um, yeah. So there. So clearly, there's this this huge framework that it all sits within. That we're we're not just looking at the child. This, this has so many connections to how we think of ourselves and our place within society as well. And we just we we sort of reduce it back and think, okay, if we can go back to the source, we'll make it easier to understand when. Actually, maybe <laughs> it introduces a whole bunch of other concerns. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if it's possible to, uh, to briefly trace how our understanding of children's development has shifted, um, particularly since the, the 60s, I guess, when behaviorism was sort of the in way of, of seeing things. I don't know if you want to go any further back than that, but um, yeah. I, I think there have been a few really key shifts that have happened since then. I'd love to get your perspective on them. Well, um, yeah, I suppose I would want to go a bit further back. Because, uh, <laughs> I thought you might. <laughs> uh, because before before behaviorism, I mean, you know, the, the, there was a, a very psychoanalytically oriented study of the child. Yeah. Uh, or, or it was before, well, in Anglophone, in Anglophone context, there's quite a, now quite a strict division between psychology and psychoanalysis, although mm. in other parts of the world, a lot of psychology is very psychoanalytic. Um, so one has to be careful about the, the claims here. Um, uh, but those, yeah, so those early child studies were really as interested in, emo well, emotions and, you know, all kinds. And you can see that in Piaget, mm -hmm. you know, he was heir to that um that whole sort of uh, tranche of work although he was a, a bit later you know he 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 wasn't in you know he wasn't interested in testing children he was interested in trying to formulate the um the whole structure of children's thought and 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 thinking and i don't think he did it sufficiently relationally but i think he was certainly yeah. doing some very interesting things um and in a way, I'm a sort of lapsed Piagetian. I mean, I did do Piagetian, a Piagetian uh, sort of, if you like, clinical or critical uh, uh, study myself at some point, as well as some, you know, engaging in a lot of the, the critiques. Um, so yes, I mean, I, so before behaviorism, there was the, if you like, a, a very uh, sort of psychodynamically oriented um, uh, understanding of children I mean and it's also worth saying in relation to psychiatry too we think of psychiatry as being um, uh, you know very very medical and uh, behave empiricist and behavioral but actually the first uh, DSM um, was very psychoanalytically informed mm -hmm. so it's important not not to forget that that sort of psychoanalytic hist history yeah, partly I mean because people kick back against it and don't want to remember it but <laughs> but it has its traces in in various ways um that that i think um we do need to be aware of uh in positive and negative ways social work also used to be incredibly psychoanalytic both in the united states you know in north america and in britain and now it's very hard <laughs> um to to find traces of that but it, you know it's important to remember that there have been different models um, so, so yeah, there was, um, um, uh, but I, I just, again, I'd like to just, having made that point, step back once again and say, um, we need to sort of, I mean, the, there's one version of that story that you could say um, that, there, that um, in a way, the study of children's development mirrors uh, changing times all the time, especially mirrors 
uh, developing and emerging technologies as well as social preoccupations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Gazelle was there at the, the beginnings of photography, absolutely perfect example, you know. <laughs> um, and then, you know, in the 19, the 1960s and Tom Bauer's studies on, on, you know, these infants doing incredible things, that was all with video. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, all these kind of, you know, fear responses of collision of objects and whatever, amazing experiments uh, in the 60s, 70s onwards. Um, and now we've got digital and um, technologies, obviously. Brain and then there's the sort of, you know, you know, fMRI scanners yep. and neuro stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so in a way, the, the shifting topics kind of reflect our available technologies and you can you can i'm sure people who study the history of ideas can trace that through being refracted through uh, particular topics in in developmental psychology um but alongside that we also i think need to ask um where and how psychology appears and disappears in our ideas about child development or development in general I mean, you know, so often people talk about child development and they assume it's the equivalent to or the same as or aligned with psychology. But actually, that's that's something that we're just sort of assuming and filling in here, um, because there are ways of studying development and child development have nothing to do with psychology. You know, it could be a the development of a particular uh, physiological mechanism um or or something in social policy so it's it, it's quite an interesting point to reflect on in its own right really of, of why and how psychology has come to assume this status this assumed status i think uh within the within um the study of and debates about child development mm -hmm. and in a way you know it's it's important to attend to that because um you know well, as, as with any kind of normalized uh, into absence sort of assumption. Um, and I think what that reflects, again, with the sort of concerns about the rise of the individual and individualism and so on, that's particularly relevant in these neoliberal times, is, is the, the sort of whole way in which um, psychology has emerged uh, or, um, or, and functions, not only psychology, but, you know, among other sort of ideas, um, uh, uh, as a key way for people to uh, think about themselves, reflect on themselves, um, including, I suppose, you know, the whole idea of your parenting mojo, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know it, it assumes that, you know, not, not just parenting, you know, that being a parent just happens, mm -hmm. um, but that's, that there's something about being a parent that requires some special effort or mm -hmm. interest or skills or dispositions um, that, that is, I, I think is very much of our, you know, our, of our time and yeah. place. And, you know, the, the, the focus on parenting as a, as a question of something that you work at or, you know, should, should you know, always a lifestyle. Uh, and, and, and various um, sociologists um, uh, have, 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 and social policy sort of feminist sociologists and social policy critics have talked about the mandates that parents sh parenting should be enjoyable and how uh, sort of uh, coercive or oppressive that can be, or you know um, how hard for parents, you know, so that you know if you lose your mojo, you've got, you want you know something, you know you've got to try and get it back. Mm -hmm. um, I mean that's the way that the sort of the, the discourse works, isn't it? Yep. Which reminds me of, you know, there's a key study that was done in um, uh, in Britain by Valerie Walkerdine and Helen Lucy, who were sort of psychologists and educationalists, um, that's called Democracy in the Kitchen. Mm. Um, and um, what they did was they reinterpreted a kind of classic study that was done um, by Martin Hughes and somebody else about how children um uh talked differently um or how they talked at home and at school in you know classrooms and at school um and they were interested as feminists 
in um, the position of, of um, the parents, especially the mothers, uh, and as, as uh, feminists very interested in, in class and the way class structures parenting identities, um, mothers' identities, because so much of psychology has been about the regulation of mothers, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> is, uh, it, it is that the, the sort of official mandates from the, the sort of parenting textbooks and including the sort of technical psychology te textbooks about sensitive mothering and reasoning with your child and democratic parenting, which all, all of this that emerged in the post-Second World War um, era of the idea that you could uh, um, encourage, you know, that the family was the place of authoritarianism uh, or anti-authoritarianism. And that's why how you brought up your children was really important. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were these huge multidisciplinary conferences um, that uh, that took place um, uh, uh, bringing together Margaret Mead and Piaget and lots you know lots of um, lots of eminent eminent experts to talk <laughs> about how you know how we can build a, a world that will not um, succumb to fascism again and they 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 saw and it's a you know this is a big <laughs> this is a big burden for parents to carry I mean they they saw the the, the possibility of of, of uh, creating that through democratic parenting. And um, what Valerie Walkerdine and Helen Lucy in their book that came out in, I think, 1990, I mean, it's of its time, and 1989, um, they, they kind of show how um, the, the working class mothers at that time are the ones who do what the bad kind of parenting of telling their children off of uh, you know being a bit arbitrary about their commands um, not giving reasons for why they're telling them to do what they're doing etc so they look like bad mothers uh, and and so they get you know described as such you know by the literature uh, and the middle class but the middle class mothers are doing all this work as sensitive parents try, um, of reasoning with their children. And instead of just, you know, the working class mother saying, do this, help me with this, um, you know, household chores, errands, etc. cetera. The, the, these middle-class mothers were um, doing the thing that the developmental psychology textbooks were saying they should of turning household labor uh, into an educational and playful experience <laughs> with the with the children um, to to and 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 this was um, you know this this is something that is what's supposed to happen and is a, a sign of a good parent but actually what they were doing um, Walker Dine and Lucy were arguing was was um, um, you know doubling their own workload in a sense and um, making their own labor at the same time less visible by converting their household labor into play and entertainment for their children. Mm -hmm. And so both working class and middle class mothers in this study, they argued were, being, were, were both being oppressed, but in different class specific ways by these mandates of what of how parenting should work in the one case they got it wrong so they were bad the other they were in a sense more subject to those imperatives um and uh, you know therefore regulating themselves and 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 uh, having to work even harder mm -hmm. you see what i mean yeah absolutely so, and yeah. I, perhaps i should have predicted we would uh <laughs> <laughs> we get to this point and and I definitely see the irony of myself with you know two related degrees and somewhat the expert I'm doing air quotes for those of you who are just listening on on this topic um yeah. partly by virtue of this education partly by virtue of, of reading these papers that are written mostly by white researchers studying white children um at the same time uh well I'm, I guess we weren't so successful at preventing the rise of fascism again were we um, um, and, and secondly, I, I, I guess I'm like I'm I'm curious about your thoughts about where that leaves us. So so if we, it seems like the the working class women in this this study weren't winning, like they weren't 
they weren't happy they weren't fulfilled the 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 middle class women weren't winning either um if we recognize that w the way that we were brought up has left us with a whole slew of problems in terms of the way we interact with the world uh, in our personal relationships in our in in the societal problems that we face more broadly um and and developmental researchers are critiquing both of those two ways of, of parenting um I, I guess the the struggle i have with this field is okay yes it's easy to critique both of these ways of doing it but that doesn't actually help us to understand what we do want to be doing what is actually going to help us what, what are your thoughts on that well, I think it's at least at the very least, I think it, it should help relieve some pressure on parents, mm -hmm. you know, to think actually it's 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 a mistake and it's really unfair to um, suggest that we can prevent fascism by bringing your children up right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you know, it takes a lot of other things happening which yeah. unfortunately probably are, are still carrying on happening um to create uh authoritarian um uh political regimes and um and okay so you know and individual autonomous uh um people from uh who've grown up as as <laughs> autonomous children uh free thinking or whatever you know the democratic thinker um it is only part of that story mm -hmm. uh, and can't be a guarantor of it yeah. and so uh, you know it's 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 really important that i think that parents don't feel they have to solve all the problems of the world mm -hmm. and and governments and social policy makers are forever uh trying to imply that uh, and intervene in ch children's and families' lives as if that's the only way, mm -hmm. um, and it isn't, uh, and it can't be. And I suppose what I, I bang on about endlessly in the book and elsewhere um, it, is that, that 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 the ways they do that, you know, in the name of early intervention to prevent something later, they're actually failing to attend to and failing to engage with all the other conditions and situations. That, uh, that promote or facilitate mm -hmm. un, you know, unhelpful ways of living and unhelpful conditions of people's lives. But it's a lot cheaper to, to install a parenting program or tell people how to uh, you know, bring up their children better than it is to you know, end child poverty and family poverty, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> For example, yeah. <laughs> For example, yes, absolutely. Okay, yes, uh, yeah. No, I, I, I completely accept that. Um, that the parenting should not be positioned as the only way that these that we address these challenges. For sure. Um, For sure. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. and at the same time, it, so, so it a lot of the time it's the same because the same people, right? The policymakers are also parents, um, and and so it it just in a way it kind of blows my mind that we are we're still struggling with this we're still trying to figure out how do we make sure that every family has what they need and can live in a fulfilled way um mm -hmm. because of the structures that we've put in place in our society that somehow seems so hard to shift even though we were the very ones who created the policies in the first place it's <laughs> it's 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 very I, I can see why people would would go down this rabbit hole of um you know let's change uh some little thing Let, let's give out a free book at a at a well child visit is one of the resilience oh, yeah. interventions um, <laughs> yes. to, to promote reading between parents and children and and look for some measurable impact in in 15 years on this child's resilience levels um yeah. That's so right. yeah, I mean it's ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, yeah. you know, you can well intentioned, but it's it's just yeah. it's just wrong. But but and I think you know, so many people approach um, uh, the the norm, you know, the ideas about parenting with very well founded suspicion because what what isn't evident uh, is the ways in which um, because of this sort of elision or confounding between child development, individual development. Uh, and, and national and international development. Actually, the the you know through the sort of quantitative and statistical technologies, um, the the sort of 
the norm is 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 an abstraction that doesn't actually correspond to any specific individual it's that's what that's what statistical norms do they're abstractions um, and that that norm is generated from uh, studies that are of sort of the you know the, the rich parts of the world and privileged people in it yep. um, and so it's not surprising that it doesn't fit the lives of minoritized marginalized people um, but they're the ones who are always deemed to be deficient or pathological and in need of um, intervention and in, yeah exactly yeah. so it becomes very uh, a sort of self-confirming legitimation strategy mm -hmm. uh pathologizing the poor and minority populations uh etc cetera, etc cetera. and you know but but actually we need to think critically about the the knowledge base and you know unfortunately people are generating very different kind of uh studies designs knowledges now to amplify that you know the the base on from which you know mm -hmm. around the cultural norms the gendered norms at, at, at class-based norms and so on yeah um but it's still very hard to budge at, at a you know even if the psychological studies are are getting much more sensitive around these questions there's still the the the, the delay into the sort of social policy um, at national and international levels is is really quite uh, amazing and you see it again and again in something like um people talk a lot about Bronfenbrenner's model I don't know if you talked yep. about that yet to your listeners so um you know you look at you look at textbooks and you see these concentric circles mm -hmm. um and you look at international policy documents on on child development and you see again the concentric circles well Bronfenbrenner apparently never made this diagram oh. and um uh because he, he he you know because it's actually quite static and structuralist mm -hmm. and he was talking about moment by moment reconfigurations mm -hmm. um and uh also so interestingly as a reflection I think of the dominant individualist ideology or you know sets of assumptions you look at those models and, and very often it's not the child and the and, and and its caregiving system that's in that's at the in the middle it's the child alone yeah that actually is a complete you know completely wrong representation of Bronfenbrenner's ideas yeah I, th I think that uh, that's elucidated in the book um as in in the the examples that you walk through on the, the visual cliff studies um uh -huh. and and I'd love to kind of walk through that to to help listeners <laughs> see how this actually happens in the research um and I think that I I I, I wasn't familiar with these studies before I started reading about it so I looked it up and I guess it's a set All of right. studies by Eleanor Gibson and Richard Walk in the 60s on what's mm -hmm. called this visual cliff and it's a table with two sides and one of them has a checkerboard pattern on it and the other one is made of the other side is made of glass and the checkerboard pattern kind of disappears on the floor underneath and so if you put a baby on the checkerboard side and they kind of peer over the edge to the glass side it looks as though they're going to fall off because the the checkerboard seems to to disappear um and so I'm, I'm curious about uh what kinds of things you see coming up in these studies that maybe we we don't usually explore when we do that when we're when we're looking at this kind of work Ah, well, it's a while since I've looked at all that material, but, um, <laughs> you know, it is, it is a great example. I mean, it, so it's a study, it, it, you know, the intention was to try and document the, the emerging skill of depth perception, right. wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and, um, but, you know, there are a lot of things going on there that are not about depth perception because mm -hmm. the child is being enticed to cross what is might be a, a chasm <laughs> um, uh, uh, by by its you know its mother. So it's about trust and relationship, mm -hmm. at least as much. Um, and um, and 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 you know you can and and it's a, an absurd and bizarre situation. <laughs> <laughs> it is <laughs> as well. <laughs> 
you know, so at so many levels, you yeah. can see the stripping away of everyday social context in these efforts to try and experimentally isolate, you know, is it is it this kind of shading of these mm -hmm. kinds of squares, etc, of which there were endless permutations at the time when, you know, um, when I when I was studying uh, developmental psychology and cognitive studies, I mean, you know, there was it, there, there was I think I still got the book. There was this this special issue of Scientific American with these classic classic key studies in, including uh, Gibson and Walk and mm -hmm. um, and um, as well as Harry Harlow. Mm -hmm. uh, the and, monkeys. And, and the <laughs> we just, talked about that. Monkeys, in attachment. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get onto those, I suppose, perhaps. Yeah. Um, but there are, you know, so so actually you know there are so many issues aren't there so many babies are carried all the time they you know and don't crawl around <laughs> you know the the conditions of children of babies lives are so different in right. different cultural contexts that the you know in a sense you can read these classic kind of uh, experiments as a as a as a particular enactment of of ideas about uh, in well certainly about autonomous individualism the child on its own you know making its journey <laughs> um, across this dangerous territory so um yeah so I, I guess the just to uh sort of pull out a particular nugget from what you said um what I want to really emphasize to to listeners is that this looks like a study of how children develop depth perception but actually we're 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 looking at a certain specific set of children who happen to be available at 10 a.m on Tuesdays with their mothers uh, and can drive to a, a campus that's probably not in the middle of town, not accessible by public transit. And uh, we can put them in this very strange situation and assume that they're going to reproduce behaviors that they would otherwise, that they would do naturally at home in very different contexts with different people around. And that yeah. the mother, we're gonna just say it's the mother <laughs> because it probably was, um, it's standing on the other side of the table in the early studies, they didn't take into account whether the mother was making afraid looking faces or excited looking faces and la later on they started to do that but um the, the the child is seen as the entire unit of study and what the child does is the only thing worth examining when actually in real life the child is functioning within a, a, a dynamic system of people and objects and everything around it um and and so that if we can say that it x ability is present at x a Age in a lab does that actually help us to understand anything useful about a child's experience possibly not <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> okay so i wonder if we can shift gears a little bit and talk about how mothers show up in research on children because we we alluded to this a little bit in the <laughs> the studies of the the visual cliff but they, they 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 show up in very strange ways in studies sometimes it seems yeah well um so mothers mothers appear as the sort of a, a presumed natural environment to children and you know historically i think we you know nowadays um people are rather more sensitive to these questions than they were um but um you know i i did in 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 my book kind of I, I was fortunate to sort of have all these um, i think i've put an acknowledgement to the library at my college you know um for for sort of they basically wanted to get rid of a load of old books and a lot of them were old old actually classic textbooks but they they kind of they're full of littered with all these very derogatory comments about <laughs> about about mothers about women as researchers mm -hmm. about you know and no woman could possibly study her child etc mm -hmm. etc um so so Mothers are presumed to be uh, the people who look after children, and all too often that remains true, actually, um, or women caregivers. But of course, it's a very um, it's a it's a very particular model of parenting that is being um, uh, presumed here that that generally doesn't acknowledge shared parenting contexts or cross generational, uh, um, you know, grandmothers and aunts, and as well as mothers looking after children or multi you know multi-generational households and joint households etc that actually um reflect the ways in which people live outside europe and north america um and even you know increasingly within it mm -hmm. so um 
so I suppose, you know, how the question of, and this is the question that always sort of, um, I, I learnt very rapidly from my days in teaching uh, gender and women's studies, you know, you have to think about which women, uh, so which mothers, mm -hmm. um, and the, the norms inscribing the developmental models are those of the middle class um, white families with the, with the sort of um, the, the, the bourgeois division of labor with the father as the sort of breadwinner and the mother as the, you know, looking after the children, et cetera. Uh, and all too often the, you know, there's also an, an assumption that there's only one child in each of the studies rather than loads of children and probably siblings helping to bring up the children. Um, so it's a very peculiar model of, of uh, uh, parenting in there. Um, and that's, I think, one very important point. The other is that, um, again, if you go back, um, and this is where I would want to alert readers to a most fantastic book, a classic book by Anne McClintock that's called Imperial Leather, Race, Gender and Sexuality in the Colonial uh, Contest. Mm, and just um, to clarify for non-English listeners, Imperial Leather is a brand of soap. <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> It's it's a it's it's still going unbelievably, um, <laughs> and um, and she writes about how um, I, I can't reproduce the exact quote, but I think it's it's really important. Basically, she's she's writing a, a history of colonial a, a gendered history of colonialism, mm. and the model of the family that came to be dominant. This model of the, the bourgeois nuclear family. Um, that we think of as arising through a particular moment of the development of capitalism, the division between public and private, et cetera, um, and the division between productive work and social reproductive work of caring, the social reproduction of the bearing and caring of, mm -hmm. of children. But all of that was happening alongside colonization of the global South. And um, in the English case, you know, apart from Ireland, which was, of course, England's first colony, mm -hmm. and those legacies really, really carry on. There's the, the um, you know, we're talking about Africa and, and India and, uh, um, and so the, the point that Anne McClintock makes um, so clearly, and lots of other studies do, but it's Anne McClintock's account is very uh, um, well known, uh, is that that model of the bourgeois nuclear family kind of not only emerged alongside that colonizing process, but there was a relationship between the two things. You know, one, rela one relationship is that the colonized people were deemed to be like, like children yeah. in need of the, the colonial parent. Yeah. You know, and I've been working on Fanon and things. He's, he does lots of things with these metaphors. Um, and the 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 other is that you know that the that within the family the family the bourgeois nuclear family was sort of seen as a microcosm of those relationships. So what you have is the benign father ruling over his children, which is the mother <laughs> and the children. Mm -hmm. You know that, and they're his property. Yeah. Um, and that these that that configuration was was in a sense part of what legitimated the colonial authority and the other way around the two work in relation to each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think what that the the contribution of that feminist work and that post colonial work has uh, and study of the colonial archive, if you like, has been to show how race and gender. Um, uh, you know, uh, enter in really deep ways in the in intimate everyday family relations. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, which you know, mothers mothers have been pivotal in all social policies and the regulation of women's uh, sexualities, dress. Uh, you know, whether they have children, when what. When they, of, have um, them. <laughs> when they have them in what yep. political in what what related kind of sanctioned relationships are okay or not etc yep. etc et you know it it's always been a, a very unfair uh, but huge object 
um, of, of concern uh, for, um, for governments, uh, as well as international policymakers. Um, and will continue to be, and, um, and doubtless the regulation, I mean, you know, now, now that we have other sort of configurations of ways of having children and, um, and, and bringing up children, um, uh, that those concerns will really generalize from the, the intense scrutiny and regulation of, and surveillance of, of, of women as mothers to anybody else mm -hmm. involved yeah. with children. Yeah, and and this this ideal of the nuclear family with a mother and a father and one to maybe three children at the most. I mean, there are not that many families in the world that look like that anymore. Um, I know that that in the book it says the majority of the world's children are born to women under the age of twenty, which uh, is in our culture seen as something that's completely irresponsible. Um, the number of babies born to single mothers was uh, forty percent across the EU in two thousand twelve, over fifty percent in several countries, and yet we still see this nuclear family as uh, mm -hmm. the center of all the policy making we do is around how to make more families like this nuclear family what, what, what's going on <laughs> with that and I, I guess i'm i'm thinking about how to to make this really concrete because we've talked a fair bit about the interaction between families and the state um and you've also talked about how women and mothers are surveilled monitored um and uh controlled in a way mm -hmm. um and and i'm i'm thinking back to an interview that i did pretty recently with dr andrew grogan kayla on spanking and whether spanking should be banned and he's of the opinion that spanking should be banned um and i'm thinking okay well i i agree that i don't want children to be spanked but I don't know if spanking, if banning spanking is the right way to go about doing that because it introduces more monitoring of families and more monitoring of certain kinds of families. Um, and, and, and sort of bring it back to your argument about uh, tracking children's welfare and tracking mother's ability to do their job as it were of raising a child. Um, where, where would you come down on a specific topic like that, that, that really makes concrete this idea of monitoring women, monitoring families and, and uh, having them perform in a certain way? Well, um, I do remember a long, uh, long time ago, there's a, a British comedian, Ben Elton, who mm -hmm. uh, stand up observational comic, who yeah. used to say, um, you know, why do women, why do women take their children to supermarkets to hit them? Um, you know, and, <laughs> but the point he was making was that the supermarket is laid out in a way to, that entices, you know, you know, there, there's children, you know, the sweets are by the checkout mm -hmm. and the child's going to say, I want this, I want this, please, you know, mummy, whatever. And, you know, it, it, it puts it puts parents in an impossible situation. And mm -hmm. so it's not it, it's the it's the environment that elicits and solicits particular kinds of actions that and and social geographers have done an amazing job at thinking thinking through the ways environments promote and inhibit certain behaviors in their in their their um policies to, that they put forward to planners about you know betting shops and gamble you know how to limit gambling and things like that you know in very you know you change the organization of space mm -hmm. um and the environment uh and you you enable a, ra a different range of behaviors so if you you know if we supported parents better mm -hmm. in various ways materially and in better gave them better context for children to live in they wouldn't you know the, the poor working class minoritized parents and, and would would not be the ones you know who were continuously being castigated for hitting their children mm -hmm. So I think I'm all with you, you know, so I don't think it's helpful. I don't like, I wouldn't, I don't like you know, violence against anyone, especially children. Um, uh, and there are many kinds of violence, but um, I don't think criminalizing spanking is necessarily the way to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, and again, it's the easy way, blame the individual, mm -hmm. uh, not take responsibility for, for how that context came about. 
Yeah. I'll yeah. give you an example from research that uh, I did um, more recently on uh, the impact of, um, well, the study was about the impact of so-called welfare reforms, which means cuts in welfare support um, to children and families. It had a particular emphasis on education because you know I joined an education department um, and it was a joint project with psychologists, counseling psychologists and, and, and uh, um, others. And uh, the, so we interviewed parents and, and it was about a particular welfare reform, which means a cut in the allowance that children, uh, that, 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 that families, which means parents, get extra money um, uh, according to um, the size of their household. And, and particularly um, uh, if they had a, deemed, were deemed to have a spare room, then, um, then that money was, was docked, was reduced. Mm -hmm. Um, and it has to be said that Britain has one of the smallest space allocations for houses in, in, in Europe and the so-called developed world. Um, so people live in very small spaces, actually, which has been just terrible for people during lockdown, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we, we were conducting this study and um, all kinds of interesting things were thrown up, you know, um, including how... Um, it actually uh, this 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 cut in welfare support um, was making it much more difficult for parents with shared custody arrangements who had a spare room some of the time for their child to come and live with them. Um, and uh, it's taken a decade to try and sort that out, actually, because it's now well nearly a decade and and, and quite a lot of court cases. Um, and it actually drove one father to instigate custody proceedings against his mother that threatened, you know, it seemed like such a stupid move because he was going to lose all custody rights if he did this because he was so desperate about the loss of money and that he wanted the child to come and live with him full time. You know, these terribly sad, very specific situations mm -hmm. and one and, and um i didn't conduct the interviews directly with parents but we had a one of our counseling psychology trainees interviewed did some of the interviews and she interviewed um this woman who was talking about you know having the choice between heating her house and eating herself or feeding her child and feeding herself yeah because that you know the money was so short yeah and this is in a rich country um, supposedly a welfare state um, and she apropos of nothing said to said said to the researcher tell your professor we are good mothers yeah so you know she said that and we weren't asking about mothering mm -hmm. we were asking about coping strategies we were asking about what you know what concerns about children's education but so closely is everything to do with how children are Mm -hmm. tied up with with parents and especially women's identities of themselves and needing to be seen as good mothers yeah not just good enough mothers as Winnicott would put it but yeah good mothers that you know it was such a telling kind of comment mm -hmm. um and I mean you know in a sense it I I felt heartened to hear it because she was speaking back it wasn't tell your professor I'm a good mother. Mm -hmm. It was we are good mothers. There was a, a sense of uh, um, knowing that she was part of a class of women as mothers or of families who were going to be negatively viewed by many, many scrutineers mm -hmm. um, and, and that she had a view on that. Yeah. And she was asserting there are other ways of looking at this. Yeah. And, and I love how that came out. I think I read that in the paper and it mm. reminded me of an ethnographic study that I read some time ago and I cannot for the life of me find it again since that was about um, working class mothers who smoke and uh, they you know have very little money and the, the conventional wisdom says 
why are they wasting their money on cigarettes, on something that is bad for them, on something that is bad for their child? We should tell them how bad it is for them and how bad it is for their child and they will stop. And this researcher went in and spent time with these families and found that the mothers are smoking because the nicotine is an appetite suppressant and they don't have enough money to put food on the table for everybody. And it's cheaper to buy a pack of cigarettes for yourself so you're not so hungry than it is to put food on the table for everybody. And so when you come in with this prescription of this is how you're going to fix your terrible parenting, your terrible mothering, you miss yeah. all that context. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious about your view of, of where are we going in our understanding of children, in our understanding of families? Um, and uh, in a way, I think it, it deconstructing developmental psychology, you know, is meant to be an, like an, an alternative textbook uh, in the sense that it speaks to the dominant discourses. It, it destabilizes, it unsettles. You know, this is what Derrida in deconstructing is, is inviting us to do. And, you know, uh, attending to the, 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 the dominant assumptions and their associated norms or axes of power. And if you kind of, unsettle them then you're loosening things up to be able being able to say um things could be different and um and so you know to in a sense to my surprise uh deconstructing developmental psychology you know i was asked to do various revisions and the second edition and third edition and i don't think i'm going to do a fourth oh, um, really <laughs> uh, but you know and and i can see how um you know that the fact that what it's still needed is is a is a matter of concern for me because I I I would have hoped that some of these mm. well some of these arguments are now being uh, more widely um, and understood and accepted but you know but if, all. if you look through the different editions as I suppose some some biographer might want to do sometime actually you know it's the attachment chapter that gets bigger and bigger every because mm -hmm. because because uh, you know the industry of work around attachment uh, I think it speaks to something about the social concerns and the way the wider political concerns get all the time miniaturized into the regulation of parenting even if it, you know, it, it then gets miniaturized even more to something digital or, you know, neuropsychological. Uh, so that some people actually argue that, you know, psychology is over. It's all, it's all neuroscience now. You know, it's very paradoxical that, you know, we have a, 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 psych, a, a whole regime of psychology that has no psychology in it. Uh, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's quite, Jan de Vos makes this argument. It's a very important one. But for me personally, what I then did was I, I, I wrote another book um, that, 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 uh, that sort of moved from deconstructing to pluralizing developments. So not taking apart, um, not reconstructing, because, I mean, the, there's a philosophical issue here about reconstructing, uh, that if you, if, you know, if you reconstruct, you already are tied to a particular normative mm. understanding of what Where it is from. you are yeah. reconstructing. Yeah. Um, so that wouldn't, uh, that, that doesn't work with that approach philosophically. Um, but, but I moved to sort of thinking about developments in a much more plural way. So, both acknowledging and then sort of disrupting, attempting to disrupt the, the, the alignments that I was I, I identified in deconstructing developmental psychology between the individual, the child, national development, transnational development, et cetera, mm -hmm. all these different developments and try to sort of explore what we can do to sort of rub them off against each other rather than use them to sort of pile on, pile the pressure on the individual child and family and parents, etc., mm -hmm. uh, and that that's now uh, that came out last year as a second edition. Mm -hmm. um, What's the name for people? It's, so it's called Developments, and the subtitle is Child Image Nation. Mm -hmm. uh, although you know now in the second edition, uh, there's more about transnational relations as well. 
Yeah. And you're, re- you're revealing me as an unprepared researcher, because normally I would read every book that somebody writes in my interview, but there, there was so much to dig into just in DDP yeah. that I got stuck down that rabbit hole and didn't go into this one. <laughs> no, well, I mean, I guess, I guess DDP is, is, you know, the more direct um, sort of relevant. I mean, developments, the book developments is interdisciplinary. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it has, it has as much cultural studies and, you know, it, it's me trying, you know, trying to uh actually actually doing what i you know what i'm i'm talking about in terms of bring you know attending to culture and philosophy yeah. and different theoretical resources some geographies some psychoanalysis um to think uh differently about children and and childhoods and and everything else that children and childhoods gets used to think about i'm very excited yeah. by um uh, sort of found uh, called uh, written a paper called Fa- found childhood. So mm-hmm. it's analyzing photographs of mater- bits of material culture around mm. children that I that seem to be unique to um, overdeveloped contexts like mine. You see all these uh, sort of children's gloves, boots, toys littered about, mm-hmm. but in other parts of the world you don't see anything like that. No. Yeah. And, and yeah, I saw a set of photographs in one book of, um, I think it was Victorian era women uh, who were uh, props to hold their baby for a photograph. And the, there was a sheet, like a black sheet draped behind them. You could see where it was hung up and, and the sheet comes over the mother's face, o- over her entire body. And all you see is this <laughs> set of hands that are protruding through the sheet that are holding the baby on, the, on her lap. It's while amazing. It's, isn't it's it? posing for its photograph. It was, I thought it was a beautiful metaphor for, you know, how we see our role in it, mother's roles in, in these psychological studies. So, um, but yeah, so, so I, in a way, I'm glad I didn't go deeper because we couldn't possibly have done any more breadth justice <laughs> in the time that we had. So thank yeah. you so much for, for talking through all this with us, for, for sharing what's in the book, as well as what's so far beyond the book. And um, I'm, I'm really grateful for your time. Okay, thank you very much. And I hope I hope this is of interest to your listeners. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm sure it will be. And so references for all of the studies that you have heard about today, including the long list of ones that I have yet to track down, as well as uh, the references to Dr. Berman's books uh, themselves can be found at yourparentingmojo.com forward slash DDP. Mm-hmm.